Good morning. I have to watch this mic. I have a um, heavy voice that carries, and um, so I'll try not to speak directly into the mic. I am delighted to be here with you this morning, and I thank uh, those involved for the invitation to come and to share my story with you this morning. Um, as was already stated, I um, am the author of While the World Watched, I am a survivor of the September 19, September 15th, 1963 bombing, and um, we'll share just a little bit of that story with you this morning. We do want to leave time for questions, and so I'll talk a little bit about that period of time. Uh, I'll read one excerpt from the book, and um, and then we'll go from there. So hopefully we'll we'll cover enough ground for you to. Uh, get the uh, feel of the book. So let's see if we can get this going here. Okay. Um, many times when I'm speaking to groups, the, the question always comes, where did it all begin? How did it start? How did you come to know or to be involved in the things that were going on in Birmingham? And I find, as I talk to young people, and sometimes adults, that many are not aware that there were segregation laws that existed, not just in Alabama, but in many states all around the country. This is a sample segregation law here. Um, it shall be unlawful to conduct a restaurant or other place for the serving of food in the city at the same room unless such white and colored persons are effectually separated by a solid petition extending from the floor upward to a distance of seven feet or higher, and unless a separate entrance from the street is provided for each race, for each compartment. Birmingham um, was segregated in every aspect of life uh, we talk about um, primarily all public facilities. Uh, we're, let me get my notes here so I can make sure I mention all of this. Uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth had, had begun waging the war in Birmingham to end segregation. Um, every aspect of life was segregated for me. That included education, that included religion, that included uh, community, uh, the community in which I live, just all public facilities. There were three defining moments um, that really helped me to understand uh, the segregation laws. The first defining moment came when uh, my grandmother was brought to Birmingham. She was very ill. And the hospitals in Birmingham did not take black patients. And so uh, my grandmother was placed in the basement of this hospital, and I sat with her until she died. That was my first defining moment, understanding the difference in the care that was provided. Uh, the second defining moment came when I had the privilege of winning the A.G. Gaston statewide spelling competition. I was our state champion speller in the eighth grade, but once again, uh, people of color were not permitted to go to the national spelling competition. And by the time I had entered the ninth grade, George Wallace had made his famous stand in the doorway and his famous statement, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. It just won't happen in Birmingham. So these three things really uh, began me to thinking about what did this mean and why uh, were we um, uh, in this um, uh, area? Well, um, mass meetings began in various churches all over Birmingham, and there are books at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute that will tell you uh, where these various churches were. 16th Street Church was used primarily as a main headquarters because of its size and because of its central location, but there were many other churches that opened their doors to this movement. And there seemed to be one common thread, one common ideal that permeated all of them, and that was to end the segregation laws, to uh, 
ask Birmingham to remove the segregation laws. These are pictures, uh, public domain pictures that sort of uh, depict what was going on uh, during the, the marching and the demonstration. Uh, you can see students downtown with signs. Some of you may be able to see this Woolworth sign in the background here. And if you look over on this side, you'll see the 16th Street Baptist Church students coming from or marching from the church. On the first day of the march, students came from all over Birmingham. Many of them marched from Fairfield and places that we might normally consider too far to walk today, but they walked from all over different parts of Birmingham, arrived at the church, and then became many of the students that uh, marched later. Uh, this is a familiar photograph, the, fire, the uh, policeman with the dogs, uh, as they uh, try to remove marchers from the area. This is uh, one of the military tanks, army tanks, that was brought out also on that day. In the background, you can also see water, uh, the water that's coming from the fire hoses and so forth. You can see people on the side and so forth. So uh, one of the things that had happened in the church prior to all of this were, was that students were given a little bit of information about what they could expect. If you march, policemen may have billy clubs, policemen may have dogs. Um, the, the big surprise was the water hoses and the army tanks. Uh, this is uh, not too good picture, but it's uh, Dr. Martin Luther King speaking at 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, as you can see, the balconies are full. The, uh, you don't see the, the lower area as well, but the entire church was full. Uh, back then, we would say that the church held approximately 1,600 people, roughly, and uh, some of the pews have been removed, so I think we say 1,400 today. But this is one of the meetings that took place in the church. Many of you may know that the 16th Street Baptist Church was the very first black church built in Birmingham, Alabama. At the time of the bombing, the church uh, had a little over 800 members. After the bombing, after the church was renovated and members came back, they came back to a membership of roughly about 400. Many people feared for their lives. They thought that the uh, bombing might happen again and so many of them did not return to the church. It was a wonderful place to be, the church itself, because it was the very first black church. When people came to Birmingham, uh, names you would remember would be names like W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Mary McLeod Methune, um, uh, Mordecai Johnson, Thurgood Marshall. When those people visited Birmingham, they always visited the church. In later years, some of the people I remember seeing would be people like Tipper Gore, um, Hillary Clinton, um, I think Rosa Parks came through there at one point, and I saw a basketball team that came from up north. Um, most people that would come to Birmingham wanted to stop at the church. They wanted to um, take a look inside and learn a little bit more about the history, primarily because of the September 15th bombing. And as I said, it was the central meeting point for the mass meetings. Though there were churches all over Birmingham that held the meetings, when they needed to have one big meeting or one central meeting, they went to 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, Reverend Wilson Fallon has defined or has described the church as a shelter in the time of storm during that period, not just 16th Street Baptist Church, but also the other churches that opened their doors to the movement, primarily because there were no other facilities open to people of color. Um, they could not use the uh, auditoriums, the city auditoriums. They could not rent uh, rooms in the hotels or in the public spaces. Uh, so they had to utilize the churches for the meetings and things. Uh, they utilized the churches to, to entertain the children. I can remember so many Easter egg hunts and picnics and different things that we did at the church. 
I can remember sleep-ins and sleepovers at the church. So it was truly the one place that we could go and call home and be free to do all of the things that we, we needed to do. This is a picture. Um, it actually looks much better on my screen, my screen than it does on this one. But uh, it's a picture of the 16th Street Baptist Church. And uh, for any of you, I would imagine most everybody now by now has seen it. Uh, this year has been the culmination of the 50 year forward events in Birmingham. And um, I have no idea of the amount of traffic that has come through Birmingham this year or through the church this year. But we usually monitor our numbers very closely and, and align them pretty closely to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. These are scenes from the day of the church bombing. Um, this first scene is on the inside of the church looking out, and the second scene is on the outside of the church looking in. Um, the church during those years was surrounded by businesses. As you can see across the street, Liberty contractors, but there were also boarding houses and department stores and eating places uh, directly across the street from the church. Where the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute stands today, uh, were boarding houses and uh, rooming houses. And so, uh, of course, you know those have been, have been destroyed and turned down. Now, um, let me tell you just a little bit about September 15th. Um, and then I want to read an excerpt from my book. Um, on September 15th, a bomb exploded um, under the staircase uh, on the outside of this church. Uh, if you're facing the church, it would be on the right side. But a bomb exploded under the stairwell, and it exploded into the church and into the bathroom where the girls were. These are the names of the four girls that were killed, Addie Mae Collins, Carol Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. We were excited that Sunday about church, primarily because it was youth day. It was our day to sing and to read and to usher and to do everything uh, associated with the church. But, uh, and our lesson for that morning was uh, in Sunday school, a love that forgives. One of the things that we did this past Sunday was to send out kind of a national bulletin across the United States. And what we tried to do was to ask all churches uh, in Sunday school and across all pulpits to reteach that lesson, a love that forgives, not only for Sunday school, but also for their sermons from the pulpit at the 11 o'clock hour. We thought that it would be an awesome and uh, sacred moment. And what a wonderful moment if all across the country we could all be remembering a love that forgives. These are, are not so good photos, but of each one of the girls as well. And I'm sure you've seen these photos many times. Dr. King would tell us later during their eulogy that um, uh, the shedding of innocent blood was always redemptive and that they might well live uh, they may, their blood might well become the redemptive force, not only for our city, but our nation and our country as well. When we started the 16th Street uh, Foundation campaign, it was a campaign to renovate the church and to keep the church in a position or uh, keep the structure of the church such that when people came to visit, it was still in good repair, and also so that we could continue to tell the story. One of the things that we wanted to do as we renovated the church was present uh, a positive image, uh, not only of where the church had been and was going, but uh, maybe an image of where we, what we thought the girls might say or do if they were here with us today. So this was the kind of the logo that we developed. If you can see that all four of them have their arms around each other and the if you look at the actual photograph or the the artwork when we put this together the girls appear to be perched on a cloud 
and they're looking down at the church as we renovate, as we move forward. And uh, I think if they could speak to us today, they would say, well done, uh, all is well, or you know, all is good. I want to read to you, uh, I am a survivor of the September 15th uh, bombing of the church, and this was something I wrote uh, in regard to that. So I do want to read it to you to give you kind of a feel for where I was at the time of the bombing and then where I am today. In 1967, and if you have my book or if you read it in the future, it's uh, page 214. But it says, in 1967, at the invitation of Dr. Marion Wright Edelman, Bobby Kennedy had visited the poor shanty towns in the Mississippi Delta, and he saw personally the plight of the poor in that area. Kennedy visited one poor family with many children and no heat. Trying to make conversation with a small boy, Kennedy asked him, what did you have for lunch today? Haven't had lunch, the boy replied. Kennedy looked at his watch. It's three o'clock in the afternoon and you haven't had lunch yet? No, the boy said. Sometimes we eat just one time a day. After that visit, Kennedy returned to the White House, determined to change conditions in the Mississippi Del Delta and other impoverished areas of the South. Now, he too was dead. Within the span of a decade, I had watched my beloved grandmother die in the basement of Princeton Hospital. I had survived two bombings. I had seen four friends murdered, and I had lost three compassionate leaders to assassin's bullets, John F. Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert F. Kennedy. And I had not yet turned 21 years old. After the renovation of the church, the church was uh, designated as a national historic landmark. Many of you uh, will remember that day when Antonio, Attorney General Antonio Gonzalez came to the church and made that presentation. In the meantime, uh, you may know also that on this past Saturday and Sunday, we made a new dedication in Birmingham. We have a native-born Birminghamian, Elizabeth McQueen, who grew up in Mountain Brook, uh, grew up to become an artist, and just happened to be in Birmingham at the time that we were looking for an artist to uh, create life-size sculptures of the girls that were killed. Uh, many artists uh, applied for this work. Uh, Elizabeth was uh, interviewed by the uh, jurors. She was also interviewed by family members and was selected to do the statues. The statues were just placed there Saturday and Sunday. I don't have a recent picture of those, but uh, you can probably find them online or in the, some of the more recent copies of the Birmingham News. Um, the statues have one message on them, and the, the message is a love that forgives. Once again, the message that was uh, being taught that Sunday morning uh, at Sunday school. Um, the statues also show uh, Addie Mae Collins tying the sash. She's kneeling in the statue and she's tying the sash on the back of Denise McNair's dress. Uh, Sarah Collins has the last view. She has the last view and the last word on what happened in the bathroom before the bomb exploded. And she tells us that the last thing she heard was Addie Mae, Denise McNair saying, Addie, Please tie the sash on my dress. Um, later that day, we would uh, lose two young men in Birmingham, Virgil Ware and Johnny Robertson. And as we uh, dedicated these statues, these sculptors, uh, sculptures on Saturday and Sunday, uh, we also remembered them. Uh, we have doves that are ascending from the statues. There are six doves, four in memory of these girls, 
but two in memory of the young men who um, ascended also uh, that day. Uh, let me just pause for a moment. We wanted to leave uh, time for questions and answers, and so I'll make a couple of statements and then maybe we can move to that. Uh, if you are one of those who has read the book or will read it in the future, one of the things that you'll find in the book will be a timeline. The timeline begins in 1948 when I was born, and the timeline comes up to this year, 2013, because we knew that we would be remembering 50 years of, of uh, moving forward in Birmingham. Each chapter of the book begins with a king quote. Uh, I think in one of the chapters it begins with, I have decided to love. Hate is too bird great a burden to bear. I have included a few pictures of myself, but also pictures that were prevalent during that era. Uh, what I've also included are some sample Jim Crow laws, like the first one that you saw. And uh, also near the end of the book is a letter from President Obama, who at the time he wrote the letter was Senator Obama. He happened to be in Birmingham and stopped for a tour. I think someone said he had 15 or 20 minutes, and he stopped for a tour, and later he wrote... Um, a letter uh, back to the church saying uh, that he thought that this was uh, one of our great uh, challenges to keep moving forward in love and healing and forgiveness. Um, since the bombing of the church, the journey that I have been on has been one of healing, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Uh, as I travel and talk about all of those things, I have received letters from people all over the world. And if you would allow me to do that, uh, I'd like to read just two letters that I have. And after that, if you have questions, perhaps we can go from there. The first letter that I want to read comes from, um, well, I, actually, I don't know. Most of these people, I get a lot of emails, and I get a lot of letters that just come in US mail. And I don't know them, but the letters are always very kind very warm and very gracious, so I wanted to just read. This one says, Dear Mrs. McKinstry, I have been reading while the world watched through a blur of tears since the very first pages. I'm grateful to you for your heart, your evident love of Jesus, and your tender telling of this brutal story. God has placed a special message in your hands that you have delivered in a powerful, in a moving and powerful expression. My husband and I are involved with the foster care system, and for the past 11 years, we have had in our custody our biracial son. This is a book that he needs to read. The racism that he has been spared is only possible through your gentle courage, and we are in your debt. Today, it seems that all doors are open to him, which I am sure are circumstances you could only have dreamed prayed and hoped for. Thank you, and God bless you. This next uh, letter comes from someone who identified himself as the cellmate, the cellmate of Bobby Frank Cherry. He says, uh, hello, Sister McKinstry. I am Willard Avon Evans, 33 years old, born March 4th, 1968, currently incarcerated for 15 years. I live in Birmingham, Alabama. I read your story in the Alabama Baptist News. I met Bobby Frank Cherry in 2004 at Holman Prison. We were in lockup together. Sister McKinstry, Bobby Frank Cherry confessed to me his role in the bombing of the, in the 16th Street Church bombing incident. I also led him to Christ Jesus and he repented and asked for forgiveness. We used to pray together and study his word together. I will never forget the day I met uh, Bobby Frank Cherry. He says, in closing, God bless you in all you do, and may the peace of God be with you. Uh, those are just two that I chose to uh, bring to share with you. But um, well, I tell you what, let me read one more, and then we'll take our questions. This one says, uh, Dear Mrs. McKinstry, on the anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, I want to thank you for your wonderful book, While the World Watch. I can't tell you how your words moved me in a way I never felt before. 
I am a 55-year-old white woman. I grew up in a small town in East Tennessee, far removed from the civil rights movement of the 1960s. I was in high school before I shared classes with African-American kids, and I just never gave any thought to how they felt growing up so differently from me. We were friends, and that's all that mattered. I have posted on my Facebook wall for my friends to read your book, and I hope they will. God bless you for your courage and your conviction that we are all children of God, and may God bless you in ministry. Um, so the, the message, again, as I travel, I receive a lot of invitations uh, from all over, and I try to talk about love, the agape form of love, which just means unconditional love. We accept each other primarily because we are all created in his image. We are all children of God. Uh, I talk a lot about forgiveness because I believe that um, there is a book entitled uh, No Future Without Forgiveness, and that book was written by Desmond Tutu, and I happen to believe that Archbishop Desmond Tutu is right. I had the pleasure of meeting him, but I do believe that there is no future without forgiveness. I also believe in healing, doing things that heal, having conversations that heal, and I believe in reconciliation. I believe that pretty much wherever I've traveled, uh, this is also what uh, uh, the, the audiences believe uh, that I speak with. So this has been my journey. It, it began as a storytelling journey, um, just telling the story of my life growing up in Birmingham. But I've come to realize that there is a purpose, there is a turning point to every story. And of course, uh, the turning point for me was just being a survivor then and knowing that um, we all have so much to give, knowing that we were all created uh, differently for a purpose. We are so much more rich when we learn about each other, when we learn about our culture and our heritage and all of the things that we have to share. It just makes us uh, so much more valuable to each other. So this is the journey uh, that I'm on today. And again, I do thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit with you about the book and my story. And uh, if you have questions, if any of you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. It's time for question and answer. If you have a question, please raise your hand and Mike or I will see that you get a microphone. Speak directly into the microphone so that the uh, volume can be recorded. Thank you. Were you injured in the explosion? How far away were you from the girls who were killed? Mm -hmm. I was not injured in the explosion, not physically. And I was upstairs in the church near the very first aisle when the bomb occurred, when the explosion happened. My name is Tyler Johnson, and I attend Self Johnson Elementary School. My question is, why would the KKK do such a ter terrible thing? Why would the KKK do such a terrible thing was his question. I, I think what, uh, remember we talked at the very beginning about segregation laws, mm -hmm. and I think the intent was just to, main, to maintain those, um, oh wait. The intent was to maintain the separate living, the social living conditions. And so uh, the bomb was meant to intimidate. It was meant to stop the movement, to stop uh, the aspirations of people that wanted to just enjoy all of the privileges that existed in Birmingham. Does that answer that? OK. Um, I guess she's doing the questions. My name is My name is Anthony Sakal. I I go to Steph Johnson Elementary. My question is, where were you during the explosion? Where was I during the explosion? Okay. 
I was upstairs. Uh, when I entered the seventh, seventh grade, I became the secretary of our Sunday school. And one of my jobs on Sunday was to take attendance and to count money for Sunday school. So at the time of the explosion, I had collected all of my reports downstairs because there were all children downstairs and there were adults upstairs. So I uh, collected those reports, went upstairs, and was in the process of collecting those reports and was standing near that first aisle when the bomb exploded. This one on the far side. Um, <coughs> Carolyn, um, you are uh, a member of the state's Constitution Revision Commission and working to, to try to update parts of our Constitution. Um, what does your background experience, uh, what is that teaching you about the work you're doing on the commission now and do you, and what do you foresee as progress of the commission with some of these issues? Maybe particularly in the area of education. Okay, what does my background as far as just this experience? Um, well, gosh. That's a difficult question, Craig, but let me, let me answer it the best that I can. Um, I will say, I would begin with the fact that I was born in Clanton, which is a place not far from here, and I was born in my grandfather's house in Clanton, and I have to pass Clanton, the exit, to get to Montgomery. When I come to the meetings, I pass Clanton, and when I leave Montgomery, I pass Clanton. And I often think about uh, here, right in the center of all of this, uh, that I, the little girl born in this house uh, who grows up and is later uh, tapped to come and serve on the commission in Montgomery. Um, I know how important education is. Um, I know how important all of the things in our, in our Constitution are. It is because I've had the privileges that I have in education uh, that I'm able to, uh, to travel and to see and to talk and to share with everyone these stories. Uh, it, it would certainly be my hope that uh, we would all continue to feel that education was very important for our students, that we would do all that we could to give all of our students the very best that we can give them. Uh, this is a difficult place to have come from. I, um, I remember when um, I started um, attending school at Sanford, a school I absolutely love, and I remember it. I began thinking initially about things that I missed. I said, gosh, I would love to have been here when I was younger with a little more energy, right, and a little better memory. Um, I, I would have loved to have been here as a young student. I love the students, I love the professors. And you know, and for a moment there, I had a little sadness in my heart, but then I, I believe that all things happen in God's time. They happen when they're supposed to happen. There's uh, our time, which is Kronos time, and then there's God timings, which is Kairos time. It happens when he intends. So I'm very grateful to have been able to go there. And as I look back on my experiences again, my hope would be that, uh, that no one would have to wait. Uh, I won't tell you how old I am, but that no one would have to wait until they're my age if they decide they want to go back that we would embrace all children, all cultures, that we would push them to be the very best that they can be uh, by providing absolutely as much as we can to make them the best they can be. Were there people physically, physically, I'm sorry. were there people physically injured and what was the damage to the church? There were people who were physically injured. Uh, many of them were taken to the hospital that day. I think the most seriously injured person uh, who lived was Sarah Collins. Many of the people had uh, scratches or bruises from debris and so forth. And um, I'm sorry, your second question was, was the, damage? the damage to the church. Um, for the most part, if you're facing the church on the outside, there was a big hole that was blown in on the back right side of the church. Um, we think that uh, there are several reasons why the damage was not greater. Uh, when we did the renovation, we had several groups of architects that came in and examined the building. And uh, one, the steps 
took a lot of the blast. The dynamite exploded under the steps, so the steps received a lot of that force. Uh, two, they talked about how well built the building was. Uh, they went down in the ground. We had kind of a leaking problem, so they were able to actually go down in the ground and see the foundation and see how well built the church was. And um, this, this was one of the primary reasons they said that this, not only that the church did not sustain more damage, but also the reason that uh, more people were not injured on that day. Just a very well-built church, and for the most part, a big hole. Uh, if you went inside the church, you saw much of the stained glass had been broken, but the church itself, if you could have picked up the glass, still was very much intact. Another student question. Huh? Okay. Hello, I'm Ilze Mario in Washington, and I'm from Self Johnson Elementary School. Who was the pastor of, of the church? The pastor of the church at the time of the bombing was Reverend John Cross. Okay. Um, I was just wondering how Sarah Collins is doing. Um, many of you know that uh, Sarah lost an eye during the bombing and um, she retains limited vision in the remaining eye. But uh, there, I know that there have been efforts underway to uh, support Sarah in whatever ways are needed. Uh, she's, you know, health-wise, she seems to, to be doing very well. Uh, she's had her challenges over the years, but I think she looks wonderful. I think she's doing very well. And a lot of people have reached out to her over, the, um, over this year especially. It, it took a number of years before even the first of the bombers was convicted. Mm -hmm. And even now there are people out there who are probably part of the conspiracy who, who are free. Is it, was it hard, was it easier to give a measure of Christian forgiveness when, when the bombers, at least some of them, were convicted? And is it difficult when there still has not been full justice? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was very difficult uh, for the families in particular. If you think about it, the first uh, bomber was arrested, Robert Chambliss, 14 years after the bombing of the church. I have children of my own, and when I think about um, a, a tragedy like that, if I had lost a child and 14 years later we're still waiting for someone to say, we haven't forgotten, we're checking on it. But um, I think that the uh, Bill Baxley understood the mood of the community um, and I think he understood it would be difficult immediately following the bombing to bring the type of justice that would have been due uh, for the death of the girl. So I believe that's why he waited. I believe he wanted hearts to soften, for the community to uh, soften a bit. Uh, now, you know, is this justice, is justice delayed, justice denied is a question that people will ask many times. But I believe, again, in God's timing, and I believe that justice came, without question it came, and it came in God's time. Um, it was many, many years, over 20 years later, that the last two people were convicted. And uh, were there others involved? Uh, will we ever know that or see them? I have no idea. But uh, I think that all of the families will tell you that they have forgiven uh, everything that has happened. I certainly will tell you that it was only in forgiving that I was able to move forward. I struggled with uh, uh, the, the trauma and the pain of all of that, losing my friends for many years, but it is in forgiving that we move on. And we can make the most horrible mistakes sometimes um, just because we don't know. Um, so I sort of dedicated myself to just traveling and talking about what happens when we teach hatred, sometimes it doesn't show up in the form that we think it will. It doesn't present itself the way that we think it will, but I think this was the result of hatred. I think that what happened that evening to those two young men was also the result of hatred. In fact, I think the news reported that one of those young men had been to a rally of some sort where there was a lot of that type of hatred being, being taught. So uh, I absolutely, I think justice has come uh, I think the families have forgiven uh, everyone, and I certainly have, and 
I think the best thing that we can do this year, this 50 year culmination is the perfect opportunity for us to revisit that question of Dr. King's, where do we go from here? And to take that question and move forward. We've reflected all year since January. It's not enough, it's not good enough to just reflect and do nothing. So we want to end our reflection by looking at all the positive things that we can do as we move forward in the years to come. And forgiveness is, is an essential part of everything that we do. Okay, uh, that actually was my question, was about forgiveness. I'll think on my feet and shift gears. What lessons do you think the civil rights movement, especially regarding forgiveness, uh, what lessons do you think they have for the international community, not just our own country. Mm -hmm. And I was especially mindful that you'd met uh, uh, Reverend Tutu, so maybe mm -hmm. if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, God has blessed me richly. I, I've had the privilege of traveling to a lot of places. And um, it seemed that everywhere I went that we always found uh, some group of people who were on the periphery of what was going on in that society. In India, it was the untouchables. Um, when I went to, um, uh, more recently uh, in Israel, I guess I could say the uh, Palestinian people there. Uh, I'm trying to remember when I was in Rome, there was an incident that happened there. But what I will say to you is that every place that I've been, even in Israel, they knew the story of everything that had happened in Birmingham. And they learned from the story. They don't necessarily know where we are today, but when you go over there, there's this tremendous expectation. When people come here, there is that tremendous expectation that we have evolved from a very dark and difficult period, and that we have evolved with hope and with courage, and the church is seen as symbolic of that courage. They know the freedom songs, the ain't gonna let nobody turn me around freedom songs. They know about the prayers and the uh, speeches. As a matter of fact, when I was in Israel, there came a point when we heard tremendous, uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was gunshots or, or that mortar overhead, but everyone right away, we were talking, but everyone right away was very frightened. And then someone started singing and, and I can't sing. My husband tells me if I sing, people leave, so please don't leave. <laughs> but uh, they, they just started singing. They said, over my head, I hear freedom in the air. And they just started singing the songs that they remembered from Birmingham. Come by here, Lord, come by here. And by the time that we sang three or four of those songs and the people just joined hands and just sat there quietly, it just brought some peace, not only to the spirit of all of the people there, but just to the whole room. And they went on to say, we will not be enemies. We will not be victims. We are going to go on in the might of the strength of the Lord and, and be all that he's called us to be. Uh, so sometimes uh, I think we are admonished to pray for those who mistreat us and who uh, don't treat us the way that we want to be treated. Uh, we're, we're to pray for those people. We're not to fight and to get into all sorts of other things. So I have seen in, in other countries all over, uh, even in other states uh, in this country, where people are determined to try to live as sisters and brothers. Um, there's one good example that comes to mind. Dr. King uses this example a lot when he would talk, and it's in many of his speeches, but he talks about people driving down the highway. He was in the car with his brother, and the brother says, uh, this is A.D. King, he says, uh, I wish people would dim their lights when they're driving. When they don't dim the lights, nobody can see, but I'll fix them. I'm gonna keep my lights on bright too. I'm not gonna dim mine either. <laughs> and so Martin says to him, Dr. King says to him, A.D., if nobody dims the lights, we're going to crash. You know, somebody has to have sense enough to dim the lights. And so even in the midst of even when you're right, it doesn't matter if everybody's gone. You know, it doesn't matter who was right if everybody is dead. So I think uh, this is the attitude that was adopted over there, and I think it's been adopted by many people here. 
We are living in probably one of the most diverse times of our history. Um, the 2014, 2040 census, I think, predicts that there will be no majority, minority uh, by 2040. And I think that we do ourselves a great disservice when we don't teach our children to respect all cultures, when we don't teach our children the history of all of the people that reside in the country. We, we have such a rich culture here. I mean, all of us love Italian food. I love Greek food. I love all food, actually. But uh, there, there's so much that we like about what, what's different from where we may have, have been raised and grown up. There are so many things that we love about each other. And what I found in all my travels in the last 30 years is that we are more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. Hi. Can I call you minister? Sure. Right. My friends call me Carolyn. OK, Carolyn. Reverend Carolyn. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you spoke on it just a minute ago about children. Oh, okay. About children. And this might be directed to the uh, state archives and to teachers uh, in this audience. Recently, I had a young lady getting her PhD in education, in elementary education. And she wanted to do a lesson plan for the sixth graders on the Freedom Riders in Montgomery. And uh, fortunately, uh, at Trenum, we were able to help her with our archives. I'm wondering, is there anything uh, afoot where we can do these lesson plans for these youngsters who are eager to learn, and not just simply an event, but as you say, a timeline, the values therein, you know, the appreciations therein. If we can pull together, I don't know if it can come under the Constitution or in civic, civics class or uh, whatever, that we can create a lesson plan, even a book for elementary school children to learn the whole panorama uh, in our quest for freedom and peace. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, uh, just a marvelous idea, wonderful idea where we can look back sort of at the beginning of our country and look at all of the people that have migrated here and sort of tell the story about each one of those groups and their contributions and where we are today and just how important it is for us to acknowledge all people. I can just tell you as a student growing up, uh, my, my elementary school has been torn down, but it was Finley Avenue Elementary. And uh, one of the things that was really important to me as a young girl was to see people who looked like me. I enjoyed seeing others as well. Today, I travel, when I travel and to these places, I'm, I'm on my own, I'm pretty much alone, but I don't meet strangers. And I think that I'm so comfortable with all people because um, when I was growing up in Clanton, my mom would send me sometimes down there, back down there to stay with my grandfather who was also a preacher. He taught school at Chilton County Training School, but he was also a preacher. And I went from the humblest of homes, where they might have two rooms and 16 people living in those two rooms, uh, to some of his preacher friends, even some of the whites in the community who respected him because he tried to set the right example and, and uh, lead people in the right direction. So what I'm saying is it was always important. I love meeting people no matter who they were, but it was always important for me to see people who look like me in pictures, on television, or when I travel. Even when I was in Israel, I met people who looked like me. And so all of us, I don't think it's just me, I think all of us want to know that uh, God creations, God's creations expands and spreads all over everywhere. And uh, it just sort of affirms, when I see people who look like me, it just affirms that you know, I'm a good person, I have good things to offer, and there are others like me who have good things to offer. This is what it should say to all of us uh, when we see people that look like us, but even when we see people who don't. Um, I think it's important what you're describing. There are many states that have already adopted a curriculum that talks about, some of them have adopted an African-American curriculum, and then uh, one or two that I know of have adopted uh, kind of the curriculum that reflects the whatever's in their state. 
That was why I mentioned Greeks and Italian. When I was growing up, there were two Italian stores in my neighborhood. I mean, there, you know, I think that's probably the history of this country. If you talk to other people in Birmingham and all over, they'll tell you that there were many neighborhoods that still had uh, that type of mixture. So how do we present that in a curriculum? Uh, we need a really good historian who can uh, give us the facts accurately. And I think the curriculum, to me, the, the, the curriculum would be the easy part. Um, I th but I know people that work in that, and can we get it introduced at the state level? Uh, well, we certainly can try. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. You mentioned two young men were killed the same day as the bombing. I just, uh, I was unaware of that until recently. I was wondering if you could briefly expound upon how their deaths occurred. Um, I actually have an article in my, my thing here, but I don't want to take the time to, to look for it, you know, and have you waiting. Uh, what I know is that one of them was relatively young. He may have been, um, I want to say, eight or nine years old. Uh, and one, I think, might have been 15 or 16. And I know that one of them died as a result of, of some young men that had been to a rally that evening, and a Klan rally, and they had been revved up, and uh, they came uh, to the community, or maybe came through that community, and he just happened to be... Uh, the first person that they encountered, and he was shot. Um, the, the younger child was on a bike. Um, and I actually do know those stories. I, I don't want to tell you incorrectly. Uh, but as I said, I have that article here. But um, that was, uh, I think that was uh, the height of, of the hatred being represented at that time. Uh, those families have asked uh, every year, repeatedly, that those young men be remembered every time that we remember the girls. So we've, we've tried to do that, and we've placed them in that same category. Their deaths were deaths uh, as a result of hatred. And, uh, but they did happen later that evening, and uh, I think if you Google them, it will tell you pretty much the, the detail behind their deaths. Yeah. This is our final question. We're running out of time. Uh, Reverend McKinstry will be here for a few minutes after, but she does have an engagement in Birmingham, so she will be here for a few minutes to sign your uh, copies of your books. And on behalf of the Alabama Department of Archives and History, uh, please visit our website because we have a vast collection of digital images that you can access through the website. Also, there are teacher curriculums that are available there, and. Uh, I know that our staff is working with the Department of Education to develop teacher workshops on Alabama history. Uh, and so please access the website at archives.alabama.gov. And thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate your visit. Ma'am, I just wanted to thank you. I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm an international student from Ukraine. My name is Katerina Kunitz, and I'm a Troy University student. And uh, uh, I know I'm from a very different culture, and I represent, like, students, uh, international students. Uh, and your lecture was very inspiring and uh, teaching and very uh, important for my heart. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>